It gives me great pleasure to have today's speaker with us. Uh, she has over 30 years of leadership experience in the top technology and pharmaceutical companies in the Valley. Uh, she is a Cal grad and uh, <laughs> with a background in psychology, so she can help you all. Uh, and then went on to get her, her uh, MBA from Northwestern. And like so many of our speakers this semester, and it truly was unintentional, any guesses where Kathleen went early on in her career to work for a couple of years? That's right, Intel. Uh, so after being at Intel for a while, she then really did switch over to biotech and was working for Genentech and for uh, Cell Genesis and had done some pretty incredible things there. And what's interesting, I think, is not only was she in biotech, but also from a finance background. So with the background in psychology, finance, and biotech, you have to come out with some pretty interesting things. And then she went to Plexicon and went, was a part of the founding group, I think, that was at Plexicon. And what's unusual about Plexicon is that during uh, Kathy's presidency there, she was able to take a group and do something unusual, and that is to bring out um, a drug that was FDA approved, and it was treating melanoma. And it may not seem a big deal, especially when you're coming from international, but in the US, it is virtually impossible to develop and get something approved, and she was able to do both. She also did a number of partnership agree uh, agreements with some large companies around the globe, like Roche in Switzerland, and then finally, in 2011, a sellout uh, for Plexicon to Daichi, I hope I'm pronouncing that the right way. Daichi, oh, I should have asked. Uh, yes, I your, your uh, seating partner actually speaks Japanese, um, for none other than a billion dollars. So if the numbers seem to be creeping higher and higher, they really, really are. Um, but what I really appreciated is that same year, uh, Kathy was voted one of the top biotech women by BioFierce, I think that's what it's called, BioFierce, and I thought that sounded pretty incredible. Uh, she's been an advisor to a number of companies since that time, and as of last fall, has been CEO for Afferent, who are working on pharmaceuticals uh, affecting respiratory and urological and chronic pain issues. So uh, not only are we lucky to have her with us, but Kathy is willing to do something a little bit different, and she's gonna talk for a while, and then she's gonna open it up to questions. And I mention that because I wanna give you all enough thinking time uh, to come up with questions on this fascinating industry and her background, especially since a number of our speakers previously have said that this area of industry is the one that's probably growing most in innovation. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming our Newton Distinguished Innovator for today, Kathy Glaub. Thank you so much, uh, Vicki. That was really a wonderful introduction, and it's great to be back on campus. Uh, I truly think this is the best uh, university in the world, and I've been to many. <laughs> so, and I work with uh, academics around the world, so um, I, I speak that with uh, some knowledge. In any case, um, I'm so pleased to be here uh, to tell you a little bit about myself. Vicki gave a very nice summary of my background, but let me give you a little bit more. So I am the oldest of six children, the youngest of whom was uh, uh, only seven years younger. I had four brothers. And I think between the four brothers and my father, who mercilessly uh, uh, um, teased me in a loving way, uh, that greatly prepared me for life in corporation, the corporate life. Uh, in any case, growing up in a big family, you do a lot of experiments, and some work and some don't. But I think that certainly uh, promoted my uh, interest in, uh, and love for discovery and science and learning. And so I came to Cal uh, with an interest in actually being a pharmacist. I entered, actually, the College of Chemistry and uh, spent my first two years taking all of the pre-med courses that uh, perhaps many of you have, have taken and uh, loved it. Um, however, I spent a summer in a pharmacy uh, working and realized 
that was not quite the interesting job I had in mind. It wasn't quite full of the scientific discovery I was looking for. And I didn't really have mentors or the linkage to uh, make that leap to pharmaceutical in industry <laughs> when I was 19 years old. So uh, I did proceed, however, with my interest overall in healthcare and uh, began to take courses in the Graduate School of Public Health, uh, thinking hospital administration. And there had the, the good fortune to get some advice from the dean of the school there uh, who told me, you should really go get your MBA because you could still do this, but you could do lots of other things. And so I went to Northwestern and uh, Northwestern actually had a subspecialty in their MBA program at that time for hospital administration. So I was initially in that program. Uh, but then I took my first corporate finance course and I totally fell in love. I thought this is really what I wanna do in life and uh, became a hardcore finance person. I had a minor in marketing as well. But uh, in any case, at the time that I was graduating, um, I was looking for that frontier, that discovery, that place where leading edge things were happening and it was happening in computing and it was happening in Silicon Valley. And so hence I ended up at Intel. And uh, I went a little farther than that. I also wanted to go where no women were and that was in manufacturing finance. So that's where I went. Of course, you know, going to Intel it was mostly men anyway. So that wasn't much of a problem. <laughs> But uh, I absolutely loved it. Um, I was an analyst initially for their oldest plant and also for their newest plant. Their oldest plant had ovens, kitchen ovens, to bake the wafers, and the newest plant was like a spaceship. It was absolutely incredible and wonderful. Um, I had the good fortune to be able to work with some of the first 100 employees of Intel. At the time, the company was about 18,000 employees and they sprinkled their entrepreneurial genes on me and uh, I, I was very smitten with the idea of building new and great products. It was a great company to start a career in. Uh, it was a very well-run company, very disciplined from a business perspective uh, and I learned many uh, really great management techniques, and it set my course for, for my future in terms of how I think about things. Uh, and in the process, of course, I expanded my financial skills. I ultimately moved to Treasury and learned how to raise money, how to, how to manage investments. I was there for the IBM uh, investment and uh, had the job of cast manager and the management team there asked, well, how are we gonna manage 250 million that comes in one day? And I gave them my recommendation, this is how we're gonna do it. And they said, okay, go do it. So <laughs> that's what Intel was like uh, back then. Uh, it was a wonderful place. Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, have a treasury role uh, for our international um, operations. I learned how to manage currency exposure and tax uh, exposures and do some very, very creative things. So when Genentech called about a treasury position, I was really well trained for that opportunity. And the link for me, of course, was healthcare, but really advanced, innovative, leading edge healthcare products. What a perfect marriage. This is perfect. Uh, it did take me six months to make the decision to move uh, because <laughs> Intel had been such a wonderful place for me uh, and uh, it, it was a tough decision for me, uh, but I decided to take the leap and I'm glad I did. However, um, Genentech at the time was 800 employees, didn't have any products yet, um, and I thought would be very similar to Intel. I thought would be similarly in, in terms of uh, entrepreneurship and well-disciplined and uh, about lots of smart people running around. It was pure pandemonium. 
uh, we had no budgets. We had 80 million in the bank, <laughs> which was basically enough for one year. And uh, I was the treasurer responsible for raising money. So uh, that was my first uh, job. It was a great opportunity nonetheless. Um, I learned how to thrive. Um, I learned how to do it. I learned how to deal with uncertainty. There were no strict organizational lines of structure. Uh, there were some reporting once in a while. <laughs> um, so it was, it was a very unusual environment to go into relatively young in my career. Uh, but I managed and was successful, um, accomplished a, a number of important financings for the company. Um, I was involved in the plan uh, as we looked longer range. Once we did get products approved, uh, we needed to look at what our longer range future held. And that future told me we weren't going to be able to make it on our own. The company was still not managing its growth according to its revenues. So we still had that issue. Uh, and the result was we needed to merge with someone. So we looked uh, at a variety of merger partners. Uh, we ultimately settled uh, with the first Roche transaction, where Roche bought 60% of the company and left Genentech alone, which was an awesome deal. Uh, the primary focus of Genentech then became only U.S. So up until that time, the company was independent. The, the world was its oyster. But now under Roche, it was going to be U.S.-centric only. So for me, as a financial person and as a treasurer, that was a more limiting scope. And it was time for me to think about moving on. So I then moved to Celgenesis, smaller again, 60 employees. And uh, this time, much more uh, manageable. Uh, I joined as the CFO, uh, quickly got things under control. Um, we were managing to develop two different major technologies, gene therapy, glad to see it back in fashion today, uh, uh, and antibodies. Um, and interestingly for me as the CFO of a public company, selling our stock to Wall Street, I realized two things. One, you're a salesman. Oh, you can do sales. <laughs> so that was interesting for me, personally. Uh, but the second thing, which was much more important for the company, was our investors either liked gene therapy or they liked antibodies. I think there was one investor that liked both. So I had an aha moment, and that aha moment was I think we should split off the company. And I think because the antibody business is not ready for prime time, we were making a mouse that would make fully human antibodies, and it wasn't complete yet, uh, we should sp spin off the antibody business. And that became Abgenix. And Abgenix went on to be a very successful company, uh, ended up being sold to Amgen for 2.1 billion, I believe. And uh, Amgen is now marketing one of those products. So we did that deal, however, in a way that was a very good deal for Celgenesis. Celgenesis ended up with shares in Abgenix. We did not give the shares to investors, which was another option. And that became a non-dilutive financing source for the gene therapy business. So that was very important to that business. Um, so next, next stop was uh, I did some interim consulting. I decided to stay home with kids for a bit, uh, for three years. Uh, I was con convinced by some good friends in the business to do some consulting for them. They wanted to hire me. I wasn't ready to do that. And that allowed me to get some experience working with some private biotech companies. And that was also very interesting. Uh, because I hadn't done private financings yet. Uh, so I always knew I would go back and find that next dream. And that next dream came in the form of Plexicon. Uh, this company was just uh, founded when I met the founders. Uh, they had just gotten some initial funding. 
and I became employee number 10. And as I always say to people, my only disappointment was I wasn't employee number one. Uh, in any case, I became the president of the company. Our CEO was Peter Hirth, one of the most fantastic drug developers I've ever had the honor of working with. And we co-led the company, uh, identifying eight novel molecules and getting them into the clinic. And as Vicki mentioned, uh, one of those went on to be approved as a treatment for melanoma. Uh, and a fantastic experience. I'll show you a little bit about that in a minute. I think the rest of the slides will, will show. Um, in any case, uh, again, smaller environment and another sort of uh, uh, thing that I often share with people is at the time I joined Plexicon, I really believed I had trained my whole career for that job. That job of going to a startup, starting from scratch, not knowing where our funding was gonna come from, what drugs were we gonna develop, what therapeutic areas would we focus on or not, um, how would we build the business, when would we partner, would we partner, would we go public or not. Um, it was the most exhilarating experience. Um, there were a few white knuckle time periods um, where perhaps we only had one month of cash left, but we managed to pull it off and uh, it really became quite the success story. As uh, Vicki also mentioned, uh, we did uh, get Zelbereff to the market and in 2011, I was able to hire our sales force for our part of our co-promotion agreement with Roche. And then subsequently, Daiichi Sankyo bought the company for uh, just under a billion. Uh, so I did think about retiring after that. Um, I joined a couple boards, uh, but I was convinced uh, to take a hard look at Afferent, and Afferent is my new baby. Uh, uh, we are five employees, I'm the fifth employee. Uh, we are doing something extremely novel, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. So uh, a little bit about the company. So we are working on a very novel target. Uh, actually, lots of companies have worked on the target. We're the only company that has a molecule in the clinic. And this molecule has shown some remarkable data in actually a number of different uh, indication studies. We're advancing it first for the treatment of pathologic cough. And it, what you see in this slide is actually the data from our first study in cough, which was published in The Lancet last fall. And we were able to show in these chronic coughers who were coughing on average 40 times an hour and have been coughing like that for over 10 years, uh, and 84% reduction in their cough frequency with treatment with our drug, which is an oral drug. So um, it turns out when you start talking about cough, uh, <laughs> lots of people start coughing, and uh, I have a bit of that cough, by the way. Uh, it, it's a little bit of a hidden um, uh, symptom that a lot of people suffer from, of course, after colds. Uh, but some people's nerves become hypersensitized. And so the receptor that we're targeting, P2X3, is a receptor by which this sensitization happens. So our molecule is blocking this receptor. Uh, and we hope, perhaps even with longer term treatment, we could even permanently reduce that sensitization. Uh, or restore those nerve fibers, because that's what we're doing. The, the, it's actually very specific nerve fibers become hypersensitized. So potentially if you treated for three months or six months, could you see a permanent restoration of those nerve fibers? That would be wonderful. Uh, so that same mechanism actually drives a lot of symptoms in other things that you're probably familiar with. Uh, it drives chronic pain, um, for instance, in urologic dysfunction, or just chronic neuropathic pain, for instance, <laughs> migraines, uh, even resistant hypertension. Uh, this receptor actually sits in a little organ called the carotid body that controls uh, your, your hypertensiveness. 
So it's a very interesting platform opportunity, and that's another reason why I found it quite interesting. And you know, my personal view is that biotech companies should be doing things that are really on the edge of science, and that's what we're trying to do. So a little more about the broader industry that um, we're talking about, pharma, biotech. So just a little background for uh, some of you, you may or may not know, you know, 35 years ago, where, were, where was the industry? The industry was really uh, focused on blockbuster products, uh, products really needed to be at least a billion dollars a year in revenues to be of any interest to pharma. And, you know, then that really meant that you were sort of thinking about one pill fits every patient. Um, and where pharma really put a lot of money was in marketing those drugs. And so the result, though, is that, yes, revenues were fantastic, but... Um, not so great for patients. So a lot of these drugs turn out to be not so effective. So 15 years ago, what was happening? Um, 15 years ago, you started to see the effects or the advent of gene sequencing. Initially, this took a long, long time, cost lots of money. Now today, you can sequence the whole genome for less than $1,000. and People in the industry are diagnosing mutations before treating patients. These are all new things that are starting to happen and developing targeted therapies. But the result here is that you're talking about smaller markets. In fact, this was a really big issue for pharma. They did not want to go here because they knew this would be smaller markets. But the way I tend to think about it is ROI is a whole lot better in this, this area if you think about it. If you have a targeted therapy that really works and you do your clinical trials in those patients where it's going to work, you're gonna have really dramatic results, just like we did with Zelbaraf. And that means you get accelerated development through FDA. So you spend less money and it's faster to market. So it's, it all ends up actually being very good. You just have to be able to do it a lot and you have to be able to do it fast, and that's something that pharma is working on. So where is the future of our industry? Well, it's really about convergence of technologies. Uh, when you think back to where we were at Plexicon, we were the result of convergence of technologies. Um, it used to be when I was at Genentech, for instance, uh, we would, our scientists were very proud of the day that they were able to solve a structure of a molecule. It only took them two years. At Plexicon, we were solving structures every week. Um, and that was the result of technologies and software and everything becoming faster, faster, faster. Better, better, better. And so more of that is happening and now a lot of what I think will happen in the future of our industry is really about collecting data, collecting uh, genetic data, collecting outcomes data from clinical trials and patient treatment, um, and obviously analyzing that data to look for patterns and then developing drugs around the patterns that you see. So I think what we're about to see is an exponential advancement in our scientific understanding of disease and ability to bring novel treatments forward. So I want to emphasize the fact where we've been and actually point out that even with biologics that are certainly very innovative medicines, when you look at whether they're effective or not, what you see in blue are patients who respond to a given treatment. <coughs> And in green are the non-responders. And you can see there's a lot of green. So patients are getting these treatments, but they're not effective. And it's not just oncology drugs. If you look across the spectrum, some of the largest selling medicines are very ineffective. So hypertension drugs are only effective in 10 to 30% of patients who get them. 
And what's the consequence? A huge waste of money. And so if you think about this ginormous healthcare budget that we have and spending that we are undertaking, a lot of it is quite wasteful. So I want to show you a little bit about the beauty of a targeted therapy in contrast. So at Plexicon, we developed Plex4032, as we lovingly called it, before it became Zelbaraf. Uh, it was a drug that targeted a specific mutation, the BRAF mutation, that occurs in about half of melanoma patients. And what you're looking at are PET scans of two patients in our trial. On the left side of each panel, you see the patient before treatment. And these patients, melanoma patients, have hundreds of tumors. It's a horrible disease. And after two weeks, only two weeks of treatment with this oral drug, you can see basically their tumors melted away. These patients could almost see their tumors disappearing in the mirror. It was really phenomenal. And these are two scans, but every patient was exactly like this. It's a pretty phenomenal thing. And the consequence of this is that we, we in, conducted our phase one trial in a very different way than most people do. Usually in a phase one trial, you're looking to test the safety of your drug. And often um, in oncology, you might test uh, your drug in any oncology patient, not just your target patient population. Uh, in a non-oncology drug, you would test the drug in a healthy volunteer. So in our phase one trial, we enrolled only patients who had been diagnosed with a diagnostic test that we were developing with Roche, uh, who had the BRAF mutation. And the end result was 81% response rate. So in a normal um, phase one trial, you wouldn't see anything really you would see nothing. You would have seen no response rate or you know, 5%, which was maybe noise. Um, people talk about waterfall plots, and everybody used to say this about this waterfall plot. It actually is a waterfall plot. Um, in a lot of oncology drugs, those, those bars are above the line, going the other way. So these are patients who, in, at the time that this was published in the New England Journal, uh, we're up to a median overall survival of 12.6 months, where when these melanoma patients had been diagnosed previously, uh, their survival was normally two or three months at best. So very dramatic. And the drama goes on. Uh, we discovered the molecule in 2005. We put it in the clinic in September of 2006. Uh, and we were able to get it approved in 2011. Um, I have looked everywhere. I believe it's the fastest development timeline ever in history. And uh, very excited to be able to say that. It was a wonderful uh, experience, wonderful for patients, um, wonderful for everyone around. And I think that proves the point that if you target a patient population and design your drug accordingly, you can get approval much faster. You, you don't have to spend as much money to get it approved. Your ROI is going to be much more attractive. And what we need to figure out is how to do this faster and faster, because there are many mutations that you could target. There are many, um, many anomalies that we need to learn more about and understand more about so that we can target them and do this again. So in cancer and rare diseases, we're certainly doing more and more of that. And it's easier to do because the science is there. Uh, cancer researchers are looking for these mutations. They're looking for what makes uh, these diseases tick. And they're targeting them with new drugs. So when cancer patients go into a hospital, it, an academic hospital, uh, they are first genetically uh, uh, analyzed, and then their treatment is determined as to best course. Uh, regulators provide lots of benefits, faster timelines, um, 
uh, exclusivity for orphans, and payers are willing to reimburse for these sorts of drugs. And patients, of course, love them. So I think this really represents the leading edge of this new age that we're in in drug development. We just need to expand our scope now into other areas. And the reason we do is when you look at the overall backdrop of the world that we're in, uh, the demand for medicines is growing, the population is growing, and it's aging. In the US, there are going to be 71 million Americans over 65 in 2030, and that has lots of consequences. Um, patients are, are, are demanding new medicines, and that availability is placing a lot of pressure on budgets. Uh, it's becoming a much greater percentage of GDP. And I just want to footnote that medicines actually are a minority of that budget. They're 15% of that budget. Uh, greater and greater scrutiny as a result is being placed on evidence of outcomes and value. So, Pharma, unfortunately, what, what are the issues that pharma is dealing with? Um, their productivity in terms of discovery and development uh, has declined in spite of the fact that they're spending more. Uh, regulations have gotten more difficult for them, especially for some of the products on the market already. And patients have become much more educated. Uh, we have a lot more information at our fingertips. And they're much more vocal about what drugs they want and what they're willing to pay for them. Pharma is losing a lot of revenue uh, from uh, their branded drugs going off patent. Um, so 148 billion uh, are being lost by the time we get to the end of 2018. And before 2012, they've already lost 237 billion. So huge numbers. And on top of that, because of the budget and economic crisis at the government level, price controls are coming up more and more often. And some countries are instituting compulsory licenses. So even if a company has a patent um, in certain countries, they are taking compulsory licenses and basically saying, we're going to make this and sell it at a generic price. So pharma needs to address these issues and make changes. And some of what they're doing are some shorter term fixes. They're focusing on biologics and rare diseases. Those are harder um, to break patents on. Uh, they're certainly easier for them to protect. Pricing is more attractive for them. They're also for focusing on uh, targeted therapies and companion diagnostics. And they are attempt they've tried many experiments, uh, very interesting for me to watch, um, many experiments to improve their R&D productivity uh, in, in a way a little bit mimicking what we did at Plexicon. So one of the things I didn't mention about Plexicon, uh, we were only 46 employees at Plexicon. Um, and pharma companies that came to visit us, and we had deals with many of them around the world, uh, would come with 25 people and increase our company <laughs> significantly with our visit. Uh, we're just amazed that we were doing what we were doing with just 46 people. Um, in their attempts to sort of refashion themselves, they've They've set up small business units, small research units. They've spun out small units. Um, they've done lots of in-licensing and collaborations. Uh, most pharma companies, when you look at their portfolios, half of the products they're developing have been in-licensed from a small company or another company. And unfortunately, they're also cutting, uh, which is not necessarily a, a good answer. Um, they are also entering some of the growth markets, uh, but those are challenging too because while demand is growing, each of those markets is quite varied and different, and the economics are, are quite challenging. Um, 
They just, they're not going to have money to pay for biologics. So challenges that still need to be addressed. I think personalized medicine is not going away. I think big pharma is going to have to figure out how they accomplish this in a, in a bigger, better way. Uh, not bigger, but a, a better way for them in terms of being able to process multiple targeted therapies through their infrastructure uh, to approval. And that's, that's been a big challenge for them. Uh, I think one thing that we, we could figure out how to help ourselves on is a good portion of the healthcare budget is spent on drugs that really are either ineffective or are treating things that could be otherwise treated with lifestyle changes. And that's lots of money. Um, so I think the answer is going to come down to more and more collecting this data, analyzing this data, and targeting therapies that are specific for certain patient subsets. Um, and the biggest change, and maybe the most difficult change for pharma, is going to be how do they change their culture to accommodate this new and very different scale um, system. I, I think that's going to be their biggest challenge. Um, one of the things we, we used to actually describe to potential pharma partners when they came to us is it's not that you can't do discovery, but discovery is something that thrives in a little bit of chaos and is definitely stifled by bureaucracy and rules. And interesting for me is, of course, Plexicon was acquired by Daiichi Sankyo, a large Japanese company. Uh, and they really wanted Plexicon and, and have still um, allowed Plexicon to operate independently, which is fantastic. Um, but in the course of the integration process, um, we were exposed to the big company part of the company. Um, and there are just so many things that I, I would have to go back to Daiichi Sankyo and say, you know, this, I understand why you have this in your larger corporate culture, but in a smaller company, that's probably not going to work. Uh, a good example would be, um, you know, they sent me their standards of business conduct, and it was a 250-page manual, and we're 46 people. It's like, you know, 46 people, we have never had an HR problem in our 12-year history. Uh, we all know how we're doing. Uh, we're, we, you know, it, it's very different in a small company. You need less rules. Uh, you need some, but uh, you need less rules. So I think this is going to be the biggest challenge uh, because those rules and regulations get in the way of decision making. And you hear that even from executives in pharma. One of the things that also gets in the way are the layers. Uh, some of the most experienced people in pharma, some of their really top-notch drug developers and research scientists are leading organizations of 3,000 people, 5,000 people. They are in a plane 30,000 feet up most of the time. They are, they're not on their projects. Uh, in contrast, at Plexicon, we had half the company sitting in a weekly meeting reviewing our projects every week. We knew everything about all of our projects, what was going on, what was going right, what was going wrong. And we had the benefit of Team IQ from the most experienced people in the whole company. So that, that will be the challenge, I think. Um, nonetheless, I think there's great potential for this industry, uh, many new technologies coming along, and most importantly, we need people who want to analyze and think about their data and who can connect the dots. That's, that's one thing you see a lot in business just in general. People collect a lot of information, but then they don't look at it. They don't try to understand it and connect those dots um, a lot. A lot can happen with that. And if you really want to be an entrepreneur in this business, 
<laughs> strap yourself in. I love this picture for a great ride. And I've posted a few questions here just to uh, sort of promote some discussion. Um, there are lots of big idea quest questions one might have uh, in this space, but uh, I, I should pause and take a step back and let you guys ask me some questions. So first of all, thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. So we want to open it up to uh, the Singapore students and also the Cal students. So everybody, please uh, feel free to ask questions. And depending on that, we can go through some of this list as well. So I know you all have questions. <laughs> Yes. Thanks. Hi, my name's Aisha. I'm a senior at Cal, and I guess uh, my question is more about your academic background. So you mentioned that you did two years of pre-med courses, and then you did your MBA shortly after. How do you know, as a, like an entrepreneur, like on the pharma side, like what? A molecule, like like you mentioned, like you know, investing in particular molecules and like different clinics. Like, how do you know, based on your academic background, like what to invest in or what you know, like segment to kind of target if you're if you're not trained in that, like you know, discipline. You're not you're not going to know unless you are sitting in rooms of scientists learning um, as you evaluate a program. So I had that opportunity both at Genentech, actually. Genentech, Cell Genesis, and Plexicon. Um, I learned a, a lot about drug discovery and development there. Yeah, yeah that, I was not trained. Thanks. I, I do tell people I'm a wannabe scientist. <laughs> Any other? Somebody back here? Yes? Huh. It's a good question. Uh, I think you know you will see smaller biotech companies grow up around a product. I mean, it's just it's it's the capital game. Uh, it takes a lot of capital to form these companies and develop your first molecule. Um, so of course that company will grow up around a single molecule, but hopefully if you've done the right deals and have raised money at the right time, you will, able, you will be able to bring more than one molecule forward. So I think ultimately there will be companies that will make it. Um, I think if the capital markets had been different when Plexicon was going you know, through our evolution, um, Perhaps we would have been public, and uh, we would have been independent. And they have a second and third molecule coming coming around that was in the clinic when we, when I was there. I have a question. Yes. Um, Unless there's another one, I hate to take up somebody's airspace. Yes. Rather have you take it up. Yes. I just want to get it on the video. <laughs> okay, hi. Uh, so I actually come from NTU. So following up to your second question, um, so you also have a second question mentioned there that if countries cannot afford branded medicines, um, is there a way to actually provide access in terms of you know compel, uh, in terms of providing a license? Now. Um, that's one question, but following up to that question, um, what I wanted to know is, so I personally am a social entrepreneur. Now, um, I come from India. Now, in markets like India, we require, you know, um, access to really, you know, go down to remote villages and, you know, provide um, these kind of uh, uh, medicines to people. So do you have any particular strategy in mind in the future, uh, you know, how you'd like to target such kind of developing markets? Um, at Afferent, we haven't gotten that far to think about that yet, but I will tell you, uh, we did think about it a lot at uh, Plexicon. Uh, it's, it's a, 
challenging uh, uh, aspect of what we need to think through. Um, I completely understand the issue for China and India uh, and other countries. Um, and frankly, I think there are issues here in the US as well. So I think the way that it's being handled currently is not working very well because the compulsory license situation is, I think, keeping brands from coming uh, to those countries. Um, but we need to find a way to address it. Um, I don't have an answer. Some companies have taken to a strategy of, OK, we will license our molecule to you. You can make it and sell it in India. But there's always this issue of um, exporting across borders. So, you know, borders aren't really borders anymore. So um, it's not a, not a perfect solution. Um, that is one solution, and that is how some companies are dealing with it. Questions? Yes, in front. I'm from NTU as well, and the question is more related to your first one. Uh, given that there's a lot of, you know, uh, consumer health um, lifestyle product, you know, steps, counters, sleep, how useful do you think those um, data are um, in terms of contributing to your new medicine discovery? Or are those data, in your opinion, not really useful at the moment? Um, the data that I'm really referring to that's being collected now, that. that you know, there's a company called Med, Medvo, I believe it is. They're collecting data. They're, they're basically signing off, uh, signing on doctor's offices, group practices, um, who allow them to collect their patient data, uh, presumably with those patients' permission. Uh, likely, I'm sure, anonymized. Um, and then they are pouring through that to understand what is the relationship between treatment and outcomes uh, and trying to make uh, uh, conclusions out of that. So that's the sort of data that I'm talking about, as well as sequencing data. Um, I'm not sure specifically what kinds of data you were really asking about. I'm just curious because there's a lot of you know, lifestyle product out there. And right. those, those things, are they really useful in, in, a, in terms of the, you know, this market? Or? Yeah, I'm, I'm really not talking about the lifestyle products. I think um, when we think about the pharma is, industry, we tend to think about the ethical pharma industry. So, you know, drugs for serious diseases, basically. That's, that's been my focus. I know lots of money is being made elsewhere, though. <laughs> so I guess I have a, a dual question. I'm just wondering in the audience, how many people think that they're in an industry that ha where they'd say they could go into biotech? Just with a show of hands. So it's not very many. Yes. And my question for you is this. OK. You have a very varied background. And you've talked about a lot of things, the skills that are needed. But I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what what skills, from your perspective, you see are needed in biotech? And I guess it's because my hypothesis, it's more than just four out of uh, 100 and, uh, 200 people. Sure. So if you could talk about that a little bit so that people Absolutely. can see themselves in that industry. Sure. So the industry is still, the biotech industry is still relatively new when you think about it. Uh, every time I go to recruit certain types of folks, I'm amazed that we still are missing, you know, lots and lots of people who have these experiences. So oftentimes when it comes to recruiting people with financial backgrounds, for instance, I go outside of biotech. There just aren't enough people in biotech with hardcore financial backgrounds, believe it or not, even today. Um, I can't tell you how many people I've recruited out of, um, you know, high tech to biotech for that. Um, likewise, uh, you know, I think a lot of people think that you need to have a science degree to be 
potentially in business development, and I don't think that's the case at all. And many people who are doing business de development who are scientists would also agree with me. Um, you need to have an aptitude. You, need, you really need to have skills to sell um, if you're a biotech company, because as a biotech company, you're usually the one selling to pharma. Um, I think if you can see yourself having being very well organized, if you think about what we do, as you manage a, a project from discovery through various stages of development, it is a huge project management um, challenge. And that takes someone who is really, really organized, willing to dive into the details. Um, are we going to have enough drug to supply this, uh, this clinical trial we want to do? Uh, being able to get in and understand, okay, 25 kilos of our drug substance translates into this many pills, and we need X number of pills per patient for this period of time. I mean, that's just one small aspect of project management. Um, and the project manager needs, needs to know all of that and to be conversant in all the typical project management tools that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, and being able to present where we are and identify issues in, in the program. Where, where are we going to miss our timelines? That's some of what I see. <laughs>